This is 14th lecture in the series of mechanics of metal forming. This lecture will cover the yielding criteria, the yield function that causes yielding for a particular material, the yield surface and the yield criteria two popular yield criteria von Mises and Tresca and uh, how these criteria are represented on graphically. These criteria would also be experimentally verified. So, we would be discussing all these related issues and at the end of uh, the whole delivery is we would be solving some of the problems to illustrate the use of this criteria. So, uh, let us recall where uh, the axial tension. So, yielding if we go beyond the elastic limit and when the yielding takes place within plastic region. So, yielding to take place under what condition? Generally, it has been, it can be seen that beyond the elastic limit and when the plastic region is start, even a small stress plastic material to flow plastically. So, yielding and flow, it is at a very minute point where the, the force or the stress becomes when it slightly greater than the yield strength of the material, the, the material is going to form permanently and that is the point where the yielding will start. The yielding may cause further the failure of a material. Failure that yielding that causes failure that comes uh, the, the if you compare with the necking and all those things that those situations usually when we form material by any process forming processes we have to avoid that. So, let us first see the yield criteria and uh, uh, once a particular material loading which is beyond linear elastic range as the Hooke's law is quite valid uh, uh, within plastic length, but when it goes beyond that the Hooke's law do not uh, uh, to force, because the occurrence of pla plastic deformation take place. And in the and material is start, and therefore, the this yield criteria has to be replaced by some constitutive equation of plastic bodies, and uh, the law that defines the limit of the elasticity under any combination of the stress uniaxial tension. There was only one axis, uh, but we will be we would be coming across a three dimensional stress field and therefore uh, there would be a any combination of stress and therefore a criteria for yielding or yield condition has to be uh, must be there uh, uh, uniaxial case uh, just now 
if we see it is very easy to define the limit of elasticity or the onset of yielding one can define in a very simple manner this equation number 1. So, there is a function, there is a function means the, the set of uh, stress field is such when this particular function of the stress field exceeds then the yield will start. So, this is represented in this equation number 1 where let the function is f sigma i square minus sigma y square. So, sigma is the stress that is the stress and sigma y is the yield stress of the particular material. That means, in this equation number 1 where the function f is less than 0 or it could be equal to 0. So, this state define the elastic and plastic range of the material respectively. For a rigid perfectly plastic material, the applied stress cannot exceed and therefore, a constant for a given material and the and that particular of the stress which is a function is greater than 0 would be considered physically which is almost not possible, it is impossible. And therefore, a three dimensional state of stress at a point is characterized by a uh, by six independent elements of the stress tensor that is sigma we discuss and when this stress when this sigma i j that is the, the stresses are small the material behaves elastically, but at a certain level and uh, combination of the stresses sigma i j the material starts to deform plastically. To distinguish between the elastic and plastic range a mathematical relationship which will define the possible combination of these stresses which will lead to uh, uh, separation of the elastic and plastic behavior of the material is very much required. So, if we assume the yield uh, condition for uh, multi axial state of the stress in a perfectly plastic material uh, can be defined by some of the yield function f if it is so. So, such that the function f is less than uh, 0 uh, in the elastic range and when it becomes 0 then it is a plastic range and therefore, the state of stress for which function f value is physically impossible therefore. So, this yield function f in in a very general manner can be expressed by this equation number 2. So, let us the function f the yield function is represented by uh, this particular equation number 2, where the f is function of uh, sigma i j epsilon i j that is the stress field strain field deuteric stress field deuteric strain field the positions that is x time domain and material constant. So, this function if we define in this manner we can say that this is an yield function f. So, assuming that the, uh, the body under consideration is uh, isotropic and, and uh, the properties are not time and temperature dependent. So, the yield function will become independent of the coordinate x i temperature uh, t, time t and time intervals. of the stress and strain. 
if the material is further assumed to be perfectly plastic with properties independent of any elastic or plastic deformation which may have occurred previously that is the any history if it is there, the yield function become path independent therefore, and can be expressed merely in terms of instantaneous stresses and an appropriate constant k therefore, has been introduced and that represents the plastic properties of the material. It is also assumed that the material yields at the same level in compression as well as in tension. So, the above function which is equation number 5 point uh, 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 equation number second equation 2 the, the can be reduced under this uh, situation that is the function is dependent if it is a function of stress field and k that is the material property. Let us look at this figure number 1, where the three dimensional uh, principal stress space has been shown, the having surface S and uh, if we take a uh, an isotropic material, the material properties are same everywhere in all the direction therefore. The material constants are therefore, independent of the coordinate transformation because it is isotropic and let us assume that the material to be isotropic under. So, the yield function can be expressed in the terms of invariance because the it has been shown that with the change of axis the invariance do not change and therefore, the name has come invariance. So, if it is so the yield function can be very easily expressed in terms of the invariance of the stress tensor and therefore, this function can be represented in equation number 4 like it is the function of invariance I 1, I 2 and I 3 and k the material property. Earlier experimental observation indicate that the hydrostatic compression R tension does not affect yielding. Explained long back also uh, second or third lecture. Hence, the hydrostatic component can be omitted from the yield function and consequently the yield function can be expressed in terms of the stress deuteric tensor only as which is the function is uh, 1 j 2 j 3 and k therefore. Since j 1 is 0 by definition we have already seen. So, therefore, the function yield function is a function of j 2 j 3 and k. Now, therefore, this criteria that is the yield criteria will reduce to a function of two non-zero invariants of the stress deuteric tensor J. And therefore, if that is the deuteric part is represented by say minus sigma i j and uh, let J 2 remains unaffected since, uh, but J 3 would be equal to minus J 3. So, the yield function should there be independent of J 3 or it should be an even function of J 3. In an isotropic material in fact, all the principal stresses must same role in yielding as the function the yield function which is function of J 2 and J 3 will be and therefore, it will be symmetric in principal stresses. So, properties of yield function, let us consider the three dimensional principal stress space which was shown in figure number 1 again, where the state of stress is shown by the stress vector uh, stress prime with stresses where the principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3s with principal stresses 
and let us see the line OH which is making equal angle with all the coordinate axis and therefore, has the property that for every point the stress state is 1 for which sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 and therefore, it is equal to sigma mean. Thus, every point on this particular line OH corresponds to a hydrostatic or spherical steady state. Let us consider passing through the origin O and which is perpendicular to OH in figure number 1. The equation through this plane will be therefore, sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 is equal to 0 or simply sigma i i is equal to where the sigma i i represents the first invariant of the stress tensor and the derivative stress invariants any point on the plane sigma i i is equal to 0 represents a derivative stress and any arbitrary stress vector sigma say can now therefore, be decomposed into component sigma m which is parallel to line O h and another component which is uh, sigma prime on the plane h s. So, these two components represent and derivative component of the stress state. So, the ill condition that is the sigma 1 consisting of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and k which is equal to 0 can now be very easily represented in the principal stress space by a surface which is called as yield surface. So, let us see this yield surface figure number 2. Now, look at the domain bounded by this surface which is the feasible domain for perfectly plastic material. When the stress vector sigma prime is inside point is in the body in the state of elastic range and the occur. When this sigma bar reaches the yield surface, those stress state which will occur to cause sigma bar to pass through the yield are considered physically impossible as already said. Is independent of hydrostatic stress state, addition of any hydrostatic to existing stress state will not influence at all in yielding and therefore, consequently surface must be open and uh, if you see here this is the what is the yield surface is being shown. So, the O h which is equally inclined. So, this line O h that is it is a cylinder it will be giving a cylinder with generators which is parallel to This cylinder is defined by the curve capital C which is shown here, this capital C which represents the intersection of uh, the cylinder with the plane S. This curve C is called as the locus, one can see the locus. So, let us look at this figure number 3. If you project this locus onto a pi plane, pi plane is a plane which is inclined uh, uh, if we from the 3 axis if we take and if we here. So, normal from the center of the pi plane will make it equal angle with the all the 
principal axis, principal stress axis. So, look at this figure, the, the, the pi plane, project it. So, this shows the ill locus which from the figure number 2 and the po if you project to the axis x y uh, sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 on the to the plane f these projections define therefore uh, sigma 1 prime sigma 2 prime and sigma 3 prime that makes the equal angle with the other which is 120 degree. So, ill locus has the same shape in each the 12 region which is inclined at 30 degree sector which is shown in figure number 3 and because of the isotropy the material the stresses sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 are interchangeable therefore, the ill locus therefore, be a symmetric about the lines A A, which is bisecting the angle between of sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3. Since the ill distress is assumed to be the tension and compression, a change in the sign of the stress will not change the plastic behavior of the material and the ill locus must have about the line B B uh, which is particular to the axis and hence the 12 sectors of the yield if you look at the figure 3 which is shown here have the same meaning to the uniaxial load case. The strain tensor and the strain in 3, 3 d state of the strain also can be decomposed into the, the elastic and plastic therefore, and therefore, this equation number 7 which is the strain tensor is consisting of the strain uh, tensor part plastic and strain tensor part uh, plastic. And therefore, one can look at this figure where the uh, sectors 1, 2, 3 and 12 sectors are shown on the pipe plane. Now, let us consider a 3 dimensional strain based on the previous equation 5 uh, uh, equation number 5 to 8. So, we have now the three dimensional strain space which is coaxial with the stress space. The plastic strain vector at a point in the space are therefore, epsilon i j p or epsilon say x x p epsilon y y p plastic corresponding, epsilon z x p epsilon z x y p p epsilon y z p epsilon z x p and the corresponding plastic strain increment vector would be d epsilon i j p or d epsilon z x p if d epsilon y y p d epsilon z z p d epsilon x z p d epsilon y z p d epsilon z x p. These are shown as a free vector which is attached to the in point of the stress field which is shown here. One can see here this figure, this is the what is the free vector and this is what is showing the yield surface. This is what is the yield surface, O is the point origin and this is the stress tensor. So, this shows the plastic strain 
increment vector and therefore, if the function yield function f is less than 0, no plastic deformation will occur therefore, that is the strain increment strain tensor increment vector p would be 0 and therefore, the plastic strain increment vector only for those vector which touches the yield surface. So, which touches here only. To determine the plastic increment vector d epsilon i j p, the therefore, stability postulate has to be considered as discussed earlier also. So, let us consider a state of stress say sigma i j uh, a which is satisfying the condition when uh, the function the yield function which is sigma i j a k is less than 0 uh, figure number 5 here. So, figure number 5 the stability postulate if you see. So, 3 cases are here. So, 3 cases a, b and c. So, consider the state when uh, uh, the external energy applies external stresses and then removes it. The in point of the stress vector therefore, moves to point B and C on the yield locus, you, it can be seen there in figure number A and then returns to point A capital A. According to the Drucker's stability postulate if you recall, the net work done by the additional stress that is sigma i j minus sigma i j a corresponding to the point during the complete loading cycle that is a b c d from a b c d it and that is that means over the surface that is the integral of sigma i j minus sigma i j a multiplied by the increment strain be equal to the summation of the two the elastic part and the plastic part and that must be either greater to 0. This is shown in equation number 9 here. So, since the work done by the is 0 for the closed path and therefore, within the closed path sigma i j minus sigma i j tensor a multiplied by the uh, increment of the uh, the plastic strain uh, tensor it should be greater than or equal to 0. This is what has been shown in equation number 10 here if you look. So, one can see in this figure A where this shows the yield surface, this is the function of uh, the, the stress tensor and the material property k and it is equal to 0 this is yield. So, the, the vector the triangle O A B so, there are 3 vectors O B corresponds to sigma i j b at the point b that is and uh, a b is uh, sigma i j minus sigma i j that is from point b to point a and uh, O a is your sigma i j at point a. So, and that what is the normal that is the uh, strain increment i j is shown at an angle alpha from direction a b. Uh, in figure 5 c where the yield surface is shown uh, having the function sigma i j k and which is equal to 0, one can see the, the normal that is n cap and uh, that is what has been shown the strain increment sigma uh, epsilon i j 
across the normal and uh, across the vector at the point uh, at uh, and that is sigma ij the stress vector st uh, uh, tensor the stability so the plastic deformation develop only in the range which lies on the yield surf locus so if you recall the figure number 5 previous figure 5 uh, 5a this is represented by line bc there that is if the point b and c are assumed to be very close to each other then the is that is d sigma ij will be infinitesimally small and the corresponding plastic strain increment vector that is d epsilon ij p can be assumed to be constant and infinitesimally small and therefore the work that is the multiplication of d sigma ij and d epsilon ij p corresponding to the plastic can be neglected and that is the stability postulate can now be expressed in this simple form by equation number 11. So, the stability postulate becomes your uh, sigma i j b corresponding to the point b minus sigma i j a which is started from point a and the plastic that is d sigma i j p it should always be greater than or equal to 0, because the, the plastic part is now no more. So, this dot product of the two vector, because these are vectors is positive only when the angle between them is less than or equal to 90 degree. Therefore, the angle between that is sigma i j b minus sigma i j a and d epsilon i j p cannot be larger than 90 degree or therefore alpha less than or equal to 90 degree. Since the stress vector that is sigma i j b has a given position as it is shown in figure number uh, 5 b and the, the, the plastic strain increment will depend only on the instantaneous stress that is sigma i j b. It is therefore, represented by a fixed, but still unspecified vector delta sigma i uh, epsilon i j p at the point b. One can see here in the figure 5 b. i j a however, can be anywhere in the feasible domain of the stresses. Now, let us consider a plane which is uh, passing through point B and it is normal to plastic strain d sigma i j p. The condition where can therefore be satisfied for any arbitrary stress field sigma i j a only when it lies on the one side of the draw normal to d uh, uh, epsilon i in other way the entire feasible domain of the stress of the plane under consideration therefore. This implies that the yield surface which is function of sigma i j and k is equal to 0, this equation a convex. This has come to be known as the convexity rule therefore, this is this convex, convexity rule is very popular. Now, again consider a plane which is tangent to the yield surface at the point under consideration shown in the figure number 5 c. So, if you see here since d sigma uh, 
uh, epsilon ijp is normal to this plane, it can be stated that the plastic strain increment value is concerned with the outward normal vector to the yield surface. It is and this is called as the normality rule. So, the first one which was called as the convexity rule, this corresponding to this one it is called as the normality rule. And therefore, it is obvious that Brook convexity rule and normality rule are interrelated. These two rules are interrelated therefore. The outward normal vector if you see the uh, in COP to be yield surface the, of the yield function which is f i j k is equal to 0 can be obtained as the gradient of the yield function and that is written in equation number 12 here which is the normal vector n cap is equal to deva f by deva sigma i j. And the plastic increment vector can therefore, be easily expressed as d epsilon i j p which is equal to n i d lambda and it equal to d lambda. Therefore, if you if you put the value of this normal. So, this is this becomes d lambda by deva sigma i j which is shown in equation number 13 here. As told lambda is the non negative constant earlier uh, and it would mean a negative strain associated with a positive uh, stress therefore. So, with this uh, relationship of the yield function, then the yield surface, the, the, the strain increment, one can now propose the uh, different areas, yield criteria, which is responsible for flow of the material during deformation. There are many flow uh, yield criteria proposed by many uh, people. The criteria that that limits to the plastic region is our, our concern. There are no our concern, we are not concerned with the other which is it acts up to the elastic part. So, let us among these, among many other yield criteria, the two criteria are very popular. One which is called as the one Meissner yield criteria, and another is called as Fresca yield criteria. So, let us look into the one Meissner yield criteria. How we now make use of the simple postulates that we have uh, discussed so far. So, one Meissner's yield criteria, let us assume the influence of the J3 on the yield to be insignificant as I. The yield becomes a function of J2 therefore, only as previously shown in equation number 6. So, let us use the yield to be uh, the simplest non trivial uh, function of J2 therefore here and therefore, the one misses which pro, who, uh, who proposed this criteria in 1913 around a very simple criteria which is shown here in equation number 14. So, the criteria is that is the yield function is equal to j 2 minus k l square is equal to 0, where j 2 is as remember the invariant second invariant and uh, that can be uh, given as it is consisting of uh, 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 these seven terms like, uh, sigma x y square plus sigma y z square plus sigma z x 
square minus my x x prime that is the derivative part sigma y y prime minus sigma y multiplied by sigma z z prime minus sigma z z prime multiplied by sigma x x prime can be again represent written it uh, which is equal to sigma x x prime is square sigma y prime is square z prime is square plus sigma x y prime is square plus sigma x uh, z x z y prime is square and sigma z x prime is square. So, this is for, uh, 15 which is equal to j 2 and since if you recall the sigma x x prime plus sigma y y prime the whole together is square it can be represented it in this form. So, that is equal to the sigma x x uh, prime square plus sigma y y prime square plus sigma prime square plus twice of the sigma x x prime sigma y y prime plus sigma y y prime sigma z z prime plus sigma z z prime sigma x x prime or it can also be written in the uh, this which is shown in equation number 16. So, it is shown uh, it can be uh, then shown as which is equal to half in bracket sigma x x prime square plus sigma y z z prime square plus in bracket sigma x x prime y y prime sigma y y prime sigma z z prime plus sigma z z prime sigma x x prime and these two set the sum has to be 0 which is shown here in equation, equation number 16. And since sigma x x prime plus sigma y y prime plus sigma z z prime is 0 and therefore, one can write down this set of 3 equations which is shown in number 17 here as sigma x x prime is equal to twice of the sigma x x minus sigma y y minus sigma z z by 3 and likewise one can also write it for uh, sigma x uh, in the other form also which is shown in equation number 17. And the same equation number 17 can so real form and therefore, j 2 becomes j 2 is equal to half of sigma i j prime sigma i j prime. So, that is the hydrostatic. So, if you substitute the above relationship and if you simplify the j 2 and one can find out uh, in a very real stress form the where the all the stresses are there. So, j 2 becomes 1 by and uh, within the long bracket which is shown here in uh, have got three terms like the first term is sigma x x minus sigma y y square plus sigma y y minus sigma z z square uh, z z minus sigma x x square plus thrice of sigma x y square plus sigma sigma z x square plus sigma y x square plus sigma x z y square plus x z square. So, this j 2 it can further be rearranged and uh, it is shown in equation number 15 here. So, that is more systematic way. So, that means j 2 becomes 1 by 6 of this 4 terms. The first term which is sigma x x minus sigma y y whole square, second term sigma y y minus sigma z z whole square plus third term as sigma z z x x whole square and the fourth term which consists of 6 and bracket uh, sigma x y square plus sigma y z square plus sigma z x square. This equation number 19 is much more uh, better equation for j. Now, so the yield criteria becomes what? 
So, the yield criteria for the one mices becomes your very simple function f given by this one and uh, therefore, it becomes 1 by 6 sigma x x minus sigma y y square plus second term as sigma y y minus sigma z x z square plus sigma z z minus sigma x x x square plus 6 of the sigma x y square plus sigma y z square plus z square and minus if you recall the first equation where k l is equal to k l square which is the k is the material property the yield distance of the material and that should be equal to 0. So, this equation number 20 which is So, the, this equation number 20 uh, the function becomes the whole together which is equal to 0. Now, let us make use of this equation and let us determine the constants. So, uh, since the yield criteria is valid for complex three dimensional stress situation, it must hold good for simple cases as well like this very simple case as the simple tensile uh, uniaxial tensile or it may as well as. Let us apply it for the uh, uh, uniaxial tension case. So, if you recall the equation number 20 here, this equation number 20. So, if you for the uniaxial tension case, what should be the condition? that means the axial tension means uh, sigma y y that is the stress in y stress that is sigma y y and sigma z z has both to be 0 and because the shear component is it is a pure tension. So, sigma x y sigma y z and the sigma z x substitute this this condition into equation number 20 sigma x x minus thrice k 1 square is equal to 0. And this is what is the condition of the yielding k l becomes the, the yield strength of the material and then then we can use it for pure shear when there is no tension we would be look we will go through uh, this part for the other uh, constant under different situation in the next lecture. So, uh, we would continue still continue in the second and third lecture of on the uh, yield criteria uh, because there is still Tresca yield criteria. So Later we have to see that how these criteria are mental basis, so that one can be sure that uh, a particular criteria would, would be which would be most suitable for plastic deformation one can decide. So, uh, I would like to thank you all for your Sense. You not to forget, give your feedback, solve the problems, objective problems on the net which is there, judge yourself uh, how much understanding you have made, and uh, let us uh, let us so that uh, we can further improve upon for your betterment better understanding. We can add up one for few more tools to the web based uh, courses. Thank you, thank you all.